glory to God. Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, my. You hear that? We, our bell ringers today are Lincoln and uh, Noah. All right. So they're doing a great job. Glory to God. Well, Merry Christmas. Well, Merry Day after Christmas, right? Praise God. I have to tell you something. We got a, uh, we got a, a Christmas card. And so my, uh, my bride opened the card, and uh, she read it, and then she handed it to me. And in the card, there was uh, a couple of gift cards. And there was one for uh, out back, I saw. And then, and then there was one for uh, Buffalo Wild Wings. And I said, glory to God. <laughs> <laughs> It just came out. I mean, <laughs> so. The psalmist said this, and you can take it to heart because God's word is true. He said, whoever goes to the Lord for safety, whoever remains under the protection of the Almighty can say to him, you are my defender and protector. You are my God, and in you I trust. And he will keep you safe from all hidden dangers and from all deadly diseases. And he will cover you with his wings and you will be safe in his care. And his faithfulness will protect and defend you. And you need not fear any dangers at night or sudden attacks during the day or the plagues that strike in the dark are the evils that kill in daylight. And a thousand may fall dead beside you and 10,000 all around you, but you will not be harmed. You will look and see how the wicked are punished. You have made the Lord your defender, the Most High your protector, and so no disaster will strike you. No violence will come near your home. And God will put his angels in charge of you to protect you wherever you go. And they will hold you up with their hands to keep you from hurting your feet on the stones. You will trample down lions and snakes, fierce lions and poisonous snakes. And God says, I will save those who love me. And I will protect those who know me as Lord. And when they call to me, I will answer them. And when they are in trouble, I will be with them. I will rescue them and honor them. I will reward them with long life. I will save them, says the Lord. You know, I, uh, I try to uh, not really pay too much attention to the news. As a matter of fact, um, I haven't watched a cable news channel since... Um, November of uh, 2020. Haven't listened to news on the radio. Haven't watched uh, a major news network. I read a newspaper. It's called the Epoch Times. E-P-O-C-H Times. I do read that. And so I guess I get my uh, uh, local and national news and international news from that. One of the things that I've read about was this, uh, there's a new, uh, uh, what do they call it, a new variant? A variant called Omicron. And as I read Psalm 91, and it says to me that uh, he will keep you safe from all hidden dangers and from all deadly diseases, and then he says, and you need not fear any dangers or attacks or plagues. And I say, Lord, let me not be fearful, let me be faithful. But as I, as I went around during the Christmas season and did some shopping and was here and there, I just saw people fearful. We're called to be faithful. I mean, now... What I read in the Epoch Times about this 
Omicron, and, and again, I'll please understand, I'm not a doctor, I don't claim to be. I'm a minister of the gospel, the truth, the good news of Jesus the Christ and the word of God. But as I read about it, apparently, um, everybody's going to get it, everybody. And you say, well, that's not good. Well, yes, it is. What if the Omicron variant is God's vaccine? You understand what I'm saying? What if it's like God saying Merry Christmas? Because apparently it doesn't have a, a significant effect, but what it does is it activates the antibodies that he has already put in you. And if you get it, then you won't, then you won't get it. I guess that's the way I would say it. So just what if, pray about that and see what the Holy Spirit would tell you. God is large and he is in charge and he knows what he's doing. And so, Lord, we trust you. We trust your word. We are not fearful. Lord, just help us to be faithful. We give this service to you this morning. Your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. I just pray you would inhabit us this morning. I pray, God, you would touch us this morning. I pray, God, that we would feel and sense your presence. I pray, God, that if we have ailments, that you would touch us and heal us. Right here this morning, Lord, that we would leave here different than the way we came. We would leave here knowing we met with you, knowing we heard from you, knowing you inhabited us because we praised you and we worshiped you. Touch your people this morning, I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Let's praise him. Let's worship him. You stand or sit or whatever you need to do. Let's worship him together.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, Lord. God for, well, for all y'all, but Scott and Yvonne, I mean, we were here uh, Friday night, Christmas Eve for service. They were here with the, with the six kids, and um, then afterwards, we had some fellowship, and then after that, they cleaned the place, and then they went home, and they did what most of us did, wrapped. That's the last minute, right? They got up Christmas morning. Now, did you do Christmas at home or were you on the road? They did Christmas morning at home quickly. Then they got on the road, drove three hours to Shippensport? Uh, Shermansdale. Shermansdale, wherever that is. 
All right, but it's three hours, right? Had Christmas there with mom and, uh, and then drove back uh, Saturday night, three hours, and uh, they're here this morning. <laughs> Glory to God. So I just thank God for them. Faithful, faithful. Not fearful, faithful. So if, uh, if Yvonne's eyes look a little heavy today or... Or, or Scott misses something here and there. We praise God. Let's do one more. Praise God. Glory! Christ is born. You may be seated this morning. Praise God. Glory to God. We're going to get ready to give to the Lord this uh, Sunday morning, day after Christmas, praise God. So if, uh, if you need an envelope for a cash offering, put your hand up, Brother Scott, will, while he's still standing, we'll get it to you, all right? Glory to God. I have a few things to tell you, so if you need an envelope, just keep your hand up. We, uh, we will not be meeting this Wednesday... We will be meeting the, uh, uh, the first Wednesday in January, all right? So we're starting a new um, group, a new study session. It's called Five Things God Uses to Grow Your Faith. Now, somebody hit the lights back there. We have uh, some of the folks that have been, that attended the last group that finished up. 
uh, we passed out the resources for the next one that's starting already. If, you're, if you are going to attend um, and you did not get a book and you would like one, put your hand up and I'll give it to you now. All right? Okay. Give that to your mom. Anyone else? Okay. So between, uh, between now and when we meet, read the introduction. And go ahead and uh, you can read through chapter 1 if, you're, if you feel really energetic. All right? Now, also in the back, we've had some prayer requests come in. We have this, uh, Brother Steve set this up. So this is for you to put your email address if you want to be part of getting emails with prayer requests. If you want to be part of praying or if you have a prayer request, you can email. So I just wanted to show you this. This will be in the back. Pastor Karen, here, put this back on the table. We've had some prayer requests come in and... Santa's little helper there. Hmm? Now, Pastor Karen, she, uh, yeah, she did something that I didn't know about, so she's going to tell you about that. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. The reason he didn't know about it is because I knew what he would say. No. So, so that's how it goes. Pastor turns 70 tomorrow. Hallelujah. I know. And I'm, I'm very, very excited. So him not so much, but I'm very excited. So tomorrow evening, uh, between 7 and 8.30, you don't have to come for the whole time. You don't have to come at all. But if you'd like to stop in, have a piece of cake, a cup of coffee, that would be great. And if you are so moved, because people are like, well, what do I get, pastor? I'm like, not another Bible, hallelujah. <laughs> um, but we're going to take, oh, he's got a number of those. But we're going we're gonna to have a basket up front here, and we're going to have, we're going to call it pastor's mission offering. So if you would like to give pastor a gift in honor of his 70th birthday, just write a check, BBCC, put mission in the bottom, and we're going to see what we can gift our missionaries uh, with the new year. Amen? Amen. 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 Thanks, Glory to God. Thanks for not being back. <laughs> <laughs> there's, listen, there's no message, there's no worship, there's, uh, we're just going to fellowship I'll be here, and uh, <laughs> praise God. I'm going to have a piece of cake. So what I would suggest is go ahead and have dinner, then come here for dessert and coffee. I have, I have something that I want to just share with you before. I want to show you something. I got, I got white papers. Normally, I have yellow papers, but I, I, most of you know Pastor Karen and I moved recently. So we are now apartment dwellers we moved into our our uh, new to us apartment and in moving uh, you don't realize what you've accumulated until you move it so I found some old white pads so I said well I'm gonna use them up but uh, but I, ha I still have a bunch of yellow pads so so anyhow I got I have white papers today you know um, many of you know that uh, our son was involved in a, in a very bad car accident and it was back in uh, September of this year and just a moment uh, his whole life his family's life and our life changed as a result of it and there was uh, there was some genuine concern I mean some real concerned that he may not walk again as a result of that accident. And uh, so he, he had surgery on both of his feet. I kind of updated m most of you on that. Some of you agreed with us in prayer about that and for him. 
So he had both his feet reconstructed, essentially. There's a lot of hardware in his feet. There's a lot of screws. One foot, I think there's a chain in it. That I mean, it's you got to see the x-rays. So anyhow, um, <coughs> the surgeon said that um, he thought maybe in two months he might start to put some weight on uh, one of his feet. So two months was up in... Uh, November, uh, November the 20th, since his second surgery. And so he started uh, trying to put weight on his, on his left foot. His right foot was still swollen after two months. Um, and things in the natural didn't look good. He's, uh, but God. He began to be able to, weight bear on both feet and he was using a walker and you know I'm watching you know my son or our, our son with with uh, you know who was a vibrant not a young man by any well young to me but I mean he's 49 but watching him who you know had worked every day of his life except the weekends and some of them he worked for 30 some years he just started working right after school, never stopped. And he couldn't do anything. It just would break your heart. And, and Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, God will take all things and work them for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I just held on to that verse, and I just kept saying, God, I love you. And God, I've answered a call according to your purpose. But I don't see good. I don't see good. I see my son crawling around on his hands and knees. I see my son struggling to get on the toilet. I see my son just in constant pain. So yesterday, uh, he walked without the walker. I mean, it wasn't uh, a, it wasn't a brisk <laughs> uh, uh, it wasn't a brisk um, yeah. But uh, we were at my daughter's for Christmas, and he came and he got in the house with the walker. But in the house, he walked around, got himself his plate, got himself his sandwiches and his salads and and drinks, and, uh, and I called him last night to make sure he was okay because sometimes what happens is when he, when he does more than he should, he, he, he gets in real pain. And he said, you know what, Dad? He said, it's not too bad tonight. He said, he says, as a matter of fact, I think maybe I need to be doing more of this. He says, maybe I haven't been working hard enough. And uh, glory to God. That's all I got to say. Because, see, I'm watching, what God, I'm watching God in all of this. Because you might say, where's God? Where was God? Where was God? He was there. I'm watching his mindset change. I'm watching his heart change. I'm watching God work in him. I'm watching God work in his wife. I'm watching God work in the kids. And I'm saying, God, you are. You are going to work this for good. So I was thinking about that as I was praying briefly this morning after I reviewed my message. And I got a word for, I don't know who it's for. I think it's for some of you. It might be for a lot of you. And it just came to me. I said, God, what are you doing now? He says, I'm restoring relationships. He says, I'm the repairer of the breach. And I'm going to make them better than new. So grab a hold of that word. That came to me this morning, whoever it applies to. Grab a hold of it. Trust them. And just wait on God. All right? Praise the Lord. 
All right, let's, did we, let's take an offering. Father God, I thank you for the privilege, as always, of giving back to you what is yours. Glory to God. I pray you take our tithes and offerings this morning and use them so that somebody would receive the gift of salvation. And I ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Hope. Here comes Hope. Come on. She's taking the offering this morning. Might take a while, but. Hey, Hope, what about me? What about me? Where's your shoes? Hmm? Problem is you can't see over the chairs, so you... <laughs> Well, I'm going to take my time today. I have a lot to tell you. Every one of these uh, orange things here is, is uh, where we're going to in the Bible. So this might take a few weeks. <laughs> but you know what? I... Uh, Listen, I go to the Lord, and I ask the Lord. There's nothing mystical, magical about this. There's nothing spooky about it. But I ask the Lord. I say, okay, Lord, what would you have me say Sunday? Just like I asked him, what would you have me say Christmas Eve? Just like I ask him, what would you have me say? And I don't know that I always get it right, um, But today's the day after Christmas. It's kind of a kind of a letdown, you know, for a lot of people, you know, because you uh, we build up, we build up, we build up, then it happens, and then it's and then it's done. And 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 I think if you're like me, sometimes I just get caught up in in the ways of the world with regards to Christmas. And is did did we get the right presents the gifts did we and and christmas eve was really good for me because it it, it grounded me back to where uh, we needed to be so anyhow the day after christmas well what is christmas well it's a day where we celebrate when uh, when god came when he came as man so now what as a matter of fact, that's the title of this message. Now what? John chapter 14, verses uh, 1 through 3. And I'm going to read it. I'm going to do uh, all the scriptures today out of the New, Ameri New American Standard. And so here's what it says. Jesus was speaking. And he says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Father God, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you, Lord, that you, uh, you didn't leave us to wonder about things that are important, but you made it clear how we were to be in a relationship with you, and you also told us about our future. 
And so I pray, God, that you would speak through me as we, uh, as we try to share your truths this morning. And I ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of years ago, I used an analogy, and I'm going to, and it bears repeating because this, so I had to go back and look it up. This is a, a good analogy, I believe, as to what I'm going to talk about for the next couple of weeks. Now, when this church opened with uh, me and Pastor Karen as pastors here, it was it was a, a situation where, well, what, what, what kind of church are we? Just what are we? And um, we believe the Holy Spirit told us three things, that we were to be a Bible-teaching church who loves people and trusts God. So that's what we are. So I'm going to teach. I'm going to spend the next two weeks, I'm going to teach as best I can about something that I think is, I think it's on everybody's mind at one time or another. And I think there's an awful lot of controversy about it. But I'm going to teach what the Holy Spirit taught me. In World War II, if you're a historian, when General Douglas MacArthur, when he was drew from the Philippines after Pearl Harbor and before the surrender of Coriagador, he issued a, uh, which has become over the years, a famous statement. Now maybe they're going to stop teaching it in schools, I don't know, but, but I was taught it. And he said this, he said to the people of the Philippines, he says, quote, I will return. End of quote. And for, for several years, if you can imagine, millions of people in the Orient, they hung on to those three words as the only ray of light in the, in the darkness of tyranny and oppression. They were words of hope that he spoke to those people. They were words of, of promised deliverance for people people around the world. And guess what? MacArthur did return. He returned with a vengeance, and he didn't stop at Manila. He went on right to Tokyo, and it was there that he received the surrender of the proud nation of Japan on the deck of the battleship Missouri. And although he was, after all, just a regular, frail human being, he kept his promise. He did return. Before the Lord Jesus left this earth to go to heaven, he said this. He said, I will come again. Amen. So we celebrated the first coming. Now I want to talk about the second coming. Because I believe that we are heading, as Pastor Tom would say, at warp speed to that end. You see, those, those words that Jesus spoke, those words have been the hope and comfort of millions of believers for the past 20 centuries. And he, as the glorified Christ in the book of Revelation, he repeated those words to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. It was on the Isle of Patmos where John was sent to that he got the revelation. Now what is that? Do you want to know what it is? It's actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it was there that he sharpened his promise and he delivered this promise in a dramatic way. Revelation 22 and 12, it won't be up there, I'm just going to quote it. He said, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. Now that might, 
That, that, I think, just that statement alone has been misunderstood. You see, he didn't mean that he was coming soon when he said that. That's, that's not what he said. He said that his coming, with all that it entailed, would occupy a very brief moment of time. In other words, when he comes, it's going to be quick. I come quickly. The book of Revelation closes the Bible with this affirmation. I'm just going to quote it. Quote, he which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly, amen. End of quote. That was the last promise that has come to us from heaven. That when he comes going to come quickly those words I come quickly they come to us from heaven those words have been the comfort of his own for 20 centuries it's the thought of some that the revelation is a book filled only with uh, that which is frightful, which is sensational. I mean, there's symbols of wild beasts, there's monsters, there's, there's creatures, there's convulsions of nature, there's, there's uh, disasters, there's trumpets, there are trumpets of judgment, bowls of wrath, right? Think about it. But all of those things are incidental. They're, they're, they're like the, the freaks that one sees at a sideshow, if you would. Because the main event is the return to this earth of Jesus the Christ. Christ's return is the central truth. The primary meaning of this book, the prevailing purpose of Revelation, is to say one thing, and that is, I will come again. Just like he came the first time. Why? Because if he said it, that settles it. The book of Revelation, it opens with a statement. And that statement is, it says, quote, the revelation of Jesus Christ, end of quote. Now, I'll look up the word revelation. It comes from a Latin word that's uh, revelatio or revelatio, however you want to say it. It's a T. And it means an unveiling. That's the meaning of it. Now, the Greek word is apocalypsis. Apocalypsis is, 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 means a removing of the veil. And, if, and, and by transliteration, it's, a, it's, a, it's an apocalypse. That's where we get that word from. The revelation is the apocalypse. The revelation is, is the unveiling, the removal, the removal of the veil of Jesus Christ. You see, because at Christ's first coming, he was, not, he was not revealed. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Everybody saw him. He was concealed. John uh, 1.14 says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's what it says, right? The word, and we know that to be Christ, was made flesh and took upon himself the tabernacle or the tent of flesh. Now think about this for a minute. You see, just as God had manifested himself or showed himself back in the Old Testament through a tabernacle with all sorts of coverings and curtains that shut man out from him, even though you could go in the Holy of Holies once a year, right? He was behind the veil. And then when the high priest did go behind the veil, there was so much smoke and incense that they only could see a manifestation. They called it the glory. They called it the Shekinah glory. It was just a, it was a, a, a bright, maybe like lightning back there. But he was hidden. 
You see, the curtain that, that shut man out from him. So the Lord Jesus, he came in a tabernacle of flesh, if you would. He was put in, a, in the concealing wraps of a human body. God was not revealed when Christ came the first time. It still can be said that no man hath seen God at any time. That's in John 1.18. That's what John said. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, end of quote. You see, Christ, when he came, he declared God. He, uh, he extigated him. He he led him out in the open where for the first time one could see the heart of God, yet no one saw God. They saw a man of flesh. That was the first coming. The first coming of Christ was not the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ takes place at his second coming. You see, at his first coming, the the you know what the great word was? It was grace. It was grace. He came that men might experience something of the grace of God. Now, when he comes the second time, the preeminent word will be glory. Because the second time, men will see for the first time the glory of God. When, when he came the first time, he was, he was veiled in human flesh. When he comes the second time, the veil will be removed, and every eye shall see him. For the first time, men will see God. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, I believe this is going to be up there, says this. So Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will, will, not might, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. When Christ came the first time, it was to settle one question and, and, and one alone, it was to settle the question of sin. He didn't come to solve the problems of government, nor to set before the world a philosophy of living. He came the first time to settle the sin question, to die for the sins of the world. That's it. He came to pay the price of sin. He was born to die. That's it. Now, when he comes the second time, he will solve the governmental problems. He will solve the political and social dilemmas that harass our world. But up to this moment, he deals only with the issue of sin in your heart and sin in my heart. This is the this is the contrast between the first and second comings of Christ. It's interesting because Scripture makes this contrast, it makes it very sharp. Think about it. He came the first time riding on a little donkey. He'll come the second time riding on a white charger. The first time he came to an out-of-the-way place riding on a common beast of burden in the womb of a woman by the name of Mary. And here's the thing. The prophets said he will come in humility. And, 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 and here's, here's what I would say about that. Um. I challenge anyone to show how God could have humbled himself more completely the first time that he came as Savior, because the second time he's going to come as Sovereign. He's going to come in devastating majesty. 
I'm going to read something that John saw in the book of Revelation. And when I read this, I get chills. I get chills. Sometimes I get teary. I want you to listen to how John described what he saw. This is Revelation. And it's uh, chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. John said, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. And he is clothed with a white robe, with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Now watch. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Nobody's going to spit in his face then. Coming the first time in weakness, in meekness, and in obscurity. But he'll come the next time in power. In power to assert his will over all the earth. The Bible says... And when they see him, every knee will bow. And every tongue confess Jesus is Lord. The question is, will you bow willingly or unwillingly? Either way, you're going to bow. Will your tongue confess willingly or unwillingly? Either way, your tongue will confess. When he came the first time, the door of the inn was shut in his face. I believe it slammed so loudly that uh, after about 2,000 years, you can still hear it. You see, my friends, he's being shut out today. Even today, even during the Christmas season, which commemorates his birth, he's shut out. Oh, the cash registers, you know, they ring so loudly that you may not hear the slamming of the door, but it is slamming, shutting him outside anyhow. However, for a second coming, we read of a door opened in heaven. I can't, can you imagine? Heaven just opens. Here he is. That door opens. He rides as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The first time the door of the inn was closed, the second time the, the, the door of heaven will open. What a contrast. What a contrast. His coming the first time, it was shrouded in secret. I mean, very few knew uh, when he came the first time. I mean, think about it. Jerusalem closed uh, the shop doors that Christmas Eve. It didn't, it didn't know what was taking place. And it could have cared less. Even Bethlehem didn't know. You know, today, the whole world knows when a head of state visits another country, right? 
But the whole world didn't know when the Son of God came to Bethlehem. And it doesn't know it after all these years. <laughs> Pastor Karen was um, texting uh, her family over the Christmas season, and, and uh, I guess, now listen, I'm not too good at this stuff, but they have these, is it gifts? Gifts. So on your, on, your, on your phone, you can find these gifts. And what it is is, I guess it's people or things that smiley faces or somebody can say hooray or whatever. So she's looking for something that says Jesus in the gift. It was nothing. There's 50 gifts. There's nothing that said Jesus. I said, well, it says Christmas, and Christ is in it. She says, well, I'm looking for something that says Jesus. There's nothing. There's no gifts that say Jesus. What the heck? God had said that his birth, his life, and his death should be characterized by lowliness. Now, what I'm going to do is, it, you see, I don't have the time that I would like to have to be able to, 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 to go through um, all of the stuff that I would like to go through. So what I have to try to do is I have to say, all right, Lord, how would you like me to talk about this in, in, in a, a short amount of time? The problem that we, that we have is we have trouble understanding the prophets. I believe that the scribes had trouble understanding the prophets then because they should have expected him. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at some of the things that the prophets said. All right? So I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And here's what it says. It says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. This is a prophecy of this Messiah to come. But it's put in a... I, 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 I saw this years ago, and it bared repeating, you see, because it's put in a, in a way that seems a little odd to me. Why did Isaiah, who repeatedly mentioned the fact that the Christ was going to be from the line of David, from the branch of David, why did, why did Isaiah in this particular verse, as inspired by God to write it this way, why did he say in this instance that he was the branch of Jesse? Well, when you look closely at Mary and Joseph, I think you might see it. And this is how, this is how you know that this is Holy Spirit inspired. Watch this. You see, Jesse was the father of King David. Jesse was a peasant. When Jesus came, the royal uh, line of David had been reduced no longer from a kingly line but to the line of a peasant in Joseph and Mary. And Jesus comes as a branch of Jesse, the peasant. There's no mistake about why God does what God does. Now listen to Isaiah as God speaks of his life. This is uh, Isaiah uh, 42 and 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. This is part of not the first coming, the second coming. 
See, this is why they weren't getting it. They weren't separating that the prophets were talking about two separate things. So he speaks. So listen, this is where Isaiah uh, speaks of his life. But before he comes in judgment, look at verses 2 and 3. It says, he will not cry out or raise his voice nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed. He will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth judgment. And then of his death, Isaiah writes this. This is 53 and 3. He says, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. And we did not esteem him. You see, these scriptures were ignored by the scribes in Jesus' day, which is the reason they didn't believe the wise men who said, well, where, and and, and I'm going to quote Matthew 2, 2. It's not up there. But they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And what did the scribes say in effect? They said, well, we don't think, we don't know anything about that. The prophecy is that the Christ will be born in Bethlehem. But anyone knows that he's not down there now. I mean, there's no reporters there. There's no photographers there. I mean, no deliverer has arisen in Bethlehem. We know he hasn't come. That's what they were saying. They were wrong. They were wrong because, you see, they had ignored the scriptures that spoke of his lowliness. They were focused on the ones of him coming in his glory, of him coming as a king, of him coming as one who would deliver Israel. Well, he did come as one who would deliver Israel, but not like they thought, not as a king would. He delivered Israel of their sin by paying the price for it. Not only did he deliver Israel of their sin, he delivered us of our sin. But they weren't looking for that. There's a guy by the name of George MacDonald. He said this, and I quote, They all were looking for a king to slay their foes and and lift them high. Thou camest a little baby thing that made a woman cry. But let's not be too harsh with them for being kind of dubious and not going with the wise men to worship him. You see, They had other scriptures that led them to believe that he was coming as a king, a king in great power and glory. Isaiah 63 and 1, they're looking at this. It says, Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Bozrah? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. This is what they're looking for. Look, they're looking for a king in a kingly robe that comes mightily. Well, there he's coming in glory. Daniel also shows a glorious coming. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting domain which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Look at Malachi. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold, 
I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. You see, such scriptures, they could be multiplied again and again in the Old Testament. And when you come to the conclusion of the New Testament, where John looks forward to his coming again, here's what we read. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he cometh with, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. They're talking about his second coming. What a contrast. What a contrast between the first coming and the second coming. Now I want you to notice... Uh, a comparison of the first and second comings here. You see, the second coming of Christ is in two phases. Now, here's where there's all kinds of controversy. But I'm going to, here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what I believe the Holy Spirit has confirmed in me. Now, that's not to say that I'm right. Because I'm human, I'm flesh, all right? But this is what I believe. If I find out it's different, I'll tell you. But for now, all right, this is what, this is the way it is. His second coming, it's in two phases. I would liken it to a drama with two acts. The first act is what I would call the rapture. Now, Christ himself was the first to speak of it. You're going to find no reference to it until you come to the 14th chapter of John's Gospel where he tells of taking people off this earth up to a place which he is going to prepare. And that's what I opened with. Let's go back to that. Verses, John 14, verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's the first phase of his second coming. But Christ also spoke of his coming to establish his kingdom upon the earth in power and glory. And when he was brought before the high priest at his trial, this is key. Now listen, when he was bought, brought before the high priest at his trial, he was, he was uh, put on oath. The high priest said to him, Art thou the Christ? the son of the blessed. You remember that? Art thou the Christ, the son of the blessed? Let's look at what he said. This is Mark chapter 14 and verse 62, and this is significant. And Jesus said, quote, I am That alone, you see, you go way back to the Old Testament and God appears to Moses in the form of the burning bush. And God gives Moses some instructions. He says, you go to Pharaoh and you tell him, you tell him from me to let my people go, to free him. Well, Moses, he says, well, you got the wrong guy. That was the first thing he said. But (laughs) 
But then Moses, realizing that he needed to do this, he said what I would have said. He said, okay, but who am I to tell Pharaoh that sent me? And God said, tell him I am. I would be like, who? I am. So when, he, when Jesus was asked, oh my gosh, here it is. When he was asked, are you the Christ? And Jesus said, quote, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven, end of quote. What was he talking about? Wasn't talking about his first coming. Was talking about what John the Revelator saw in the vision that the Holy Spirit gave him of the second coming. In the first, in, 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 so we see that Christ himself spoke of both phases of his coming again. That first phase was in John 14 where he's telling his disciples, I'm, gonna, I'm preparing a place. I'm going to come and take you where I am. And then when he's questioned about who he is, he says, I am. He says, and then you're going to see me coming on the clouds in great glory. He spoke of both phases of his coming again. The first phase of the second coming uh, of Christ is to believers. We call it the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. You see, there is nothing between us and that. Hear me now. What do you mean, Pastor? There is nothing between us and that. No great tribulation. No other event that must take place. He could come today, but we don't say that he will because we don't know. But we today are not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Christ. We're looking to be taken to the place that he has prepared for us. Watch this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Listen, these are not my words. These are his words. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then... We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. Pastor Tom says, hashtag looking up. <laughs> After our gathering together unto him, the second phase of the second coming of Christ will come upon the earth. And it'll begin with a time of great trouble. The world's moving into it at this, at this moment, just as a boat moves into a tornado or into a typhoon at sea. Our world is moving into this time of trouble. Christ said it will be a, a, a short interval which will be blocked off by catastrophes Quote, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time known nor ever shall be. End of quote. In other words, the world is heading into a time that it's going to experience nothing that has ever taken place like it. 
but not us. We're going to watch. We're going to watch. We're going to be in glory. We're going to be watching with the armies of God. As a matter of fact, when the second phase of the second coming happens, I think we're coming with the armies. That's what I think. I've got to stop there. <laughs> well, we're out of time. Um, I'm telling you as best as I can, based on the word of God, as I understand it, all right? And I pray the Holy Spirit give me understanding because in and of myself, I know nothing, <laughs> okay? Lord, I pray a blessing on your people this morning. I pray your supernatural protection on them from sickness, disease, and from the evil one. And Lord, I just ask that you would put a joy in their hearts today. And that joy would last tomorrow and the next day and the next day till we come together again corporately in your presence. And I ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Hey, he's coming back. The blessed hope.